I'm Dave Garcia, this is Advocate from ECA, and I'm also a member of the Say, I'll, I'll go over there. That um, it's good to have somebody here who went to Ohio State. Um, I wish that SC played Ohio State and Michigan every year because it would make their schedule a lot easier. Um, <laughs> but let's not let's not be distracted by that. Um, I want to comment a little bit about the future and the and the. What I would call the cumulative risk that we face. Um, I want to talk about my view of the management of the MTA and what we need to do to do a better job of taxpayers' money. And then I'll talk about what we're doing in terms of Measure R and 310 and the bus and rail transit system as well as the highway system. First of all, as regards cumulative risk. We hear a lot of discussion these days about global warming. It's occurring right now in this room, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a bigger room part or a fan. Um, yeah, it's all right. So some believe that global warming is occurring. And they look, they they cite minor facts like like you know melting polar ice caps, things of that nature. Others believe that, uh, that the science is bad, and people get hung up on that that discussion. Is there a global warming or not? Part of the discussion of that should include the risk. What percent probability do we believe One, two, there is <laughs> that global warming is occurring? But whatever that, whatever that risk is and what's acceptable, I would add to it a few other things. Um, I think that our fuel supply lines emanate principally in countries that are militarily and politically unstable. Anybody disagree with that? I believe that many, many of the supplies come from places where the folks don't especially like us. I believe that we're spending, spending an awful lot of money overseas for fuel. Pipelines are fragile. They're vulnerable. This represents a strategic risk for the country. Anybody wants to argue against that, I'll, I'll sit down and listen to you. Separate from that, but adding to this issue of cumulative risk, and I would, I would cumulative risk, like what percent probability is that all the pipelines are going to be disrupted? I don't know, but it's not zero. It's closer to 100% than it is zero. And it, that disruption doesn't mean forever disruption. You know, a three or four month disruption is pretty serious in a place like Los Angeles. When I say LA, I don't mean LA City. I mean this big place. But in addition to that, we have a situation in which production of oil has been flat for about five years, and yet consumption is climbing in India and China. So what that means is, what happens when supplies are constant, stable, and demand increases? Prices go up. What I take this to mean is that we're going to live in a world in the future which is different than the world that most of us grew up in, except those of you who are young. I'm referring to the world that Tom Rubin grew up in and where the old folks are. <laughs> we go back 25 years, so don't be put off on that. Um, you know, the era of cheap gasoline is over. And that means we have to prepare for a world which is different than the one that we all know today. I think that there's that big problem. As regards the manager of the MTA, um, I would offer several criticisms of the organization, which I've shared with the board of directors. I think there needs to be much better focus by MTA. I've said this to you last time I was here. Better focus on service management, better focus on frugality, um, things of that nature. I look at the organization, I look at things like deferred maintenance. There's millions of dollars of deferred maintenance in MTA. Buses, trains, um, rail stations, bus stations, bus divisions, headquarters. We cannot go on 
deferring maintenance on our rolling stock. We can, we, it's, it's great to buy a bus on my last 15 or 20 years of CNG bus, but you got to rehab it midway through. It's great to buy a bus that you paint every six or eight years that looks like, in the vernacular, looks like crap. We need to do a better job of cleaning up the fleet, painting the buses perhaps every four years, cleaning the stations. I believe there are stations that haven't been cleaned in 15 years. They're being cleaned today. We need to stop the furring maintenance. On the, the transit system, we need to get managers that understand transit, that understand maintenance, bus and rail, that understand service management, that understand radio dispatch. I'm 62 next week. I heard on in 1971 when the industry was managed by people who had their roots in the private sector. We're going to have a, when I talk to college students or young managers, I say, you've picked a really bad time to finish college, you know, because the baby boomers are afraid to retire because of the recession. <coughs> so the, the pipeline of promotions is clogged. The ladder of success is blocked. You know, you're not going to make any advancement. So I, then I let them sit for a few seconds, and they're sitting there going, oh, man, this is really bad news. And then I say, but don't worry. Get ready. Because any minute now, we all know this, what are the baby boomers going to start doing? They're going to start dropping like flies. When that happens, the pipeline of promotions will be unclogged and the ladder of success unlocked. There is opportunity here. It's just not this moment. It's two or three or four or five years out, right? Alan, not unlike the 70s. Right. Exactly the same thing. Same thing. So what that means at MTA is we have a couple, three years to develop the next manage, next generation of managers who, who A, care about transit and service, and B, understand it. So we have, we have an immediate short-term problem in terms of training the next generation of managers. And we're making progress on that. I won't dwell on it. We've got a bunch of stuff if you care about it, I'll tell you later on. I think that um, we need to get focused, as we were when I was growing up in transit, on pennies and pennies. At the same time, we have a capital program to deliver, uh, which is embedded in Measure R. Now, a person can say that they agree or disagree with Measure R, and that's fine. God bless America, God bless the First Amendment. But the board of directors of the MTA, who tell me what to do, um, look at Measure R as a foundational document. By the way, if I say Measure M, it doesn't mean I've gone crazy, I just forgot where I am. Uh, it's Measure M in Orange County. Um, and so we have 15 major highway projects to do, we have a dozen rail projects to do, and a bunch of other stuff I won't go through in detail. So what does that take us to? Um, when I, when I, I've been here coming up to two years at MTA. If I look at, at where the MTA was, when I say MTA, uh, that's without regard to the historical implications of RTD and all that stuff. Um, if I go back to the uh, 85 to 1990, Ridership ranged from a high of about 70 passengers per hour in around 1985, maybe dropped maybe to about 60 passengers per hour, somewhere in that range. Um, the MTA was by far the largest <coughs> provider of bus service uh, in the county uh, during that time period. The communities were much smaller than they are today. Rail lines didn't exist, Metrolink didn't exist, it was a different world. Today, what we find is 25 years later, it's a very different situation. Where MTA today provides, I don't know, 70% of the bus service. The communities have gone up from 1 million, round numbers, 1 million hours per year to about 4 million. Um, we have four or five rail lines running, and we have Metrolink running. Um, so we have a much more complex transit system. And one can argue whether that's good or bad, but that's what's happened. Tom and I were there during the transit wars, 25 years ago, and that is the net outcome. 
25 years ago, MTA ran around 7 million hours of service a year, and the Muni's ran around 1 million. A total of 8 million. No rail cars, no rail service. Today, with the reductions we're going to talk about in June, we'll be at about 6.5 million. The Muni's are 3.8, 4.0 million hours per year, and there's a bunch of rail service out there. I can't, so I can't corner them. I don't have a number on top of my tongue with how many hours of rail service we've done. Anyway, we have a very different mix of services. All of these services are funded through MTA from a variety of sources. When I look at the ridership today as compared to 25 years ago, and you should focus on this because this will be the nub of, of difference of opinion between myself and the Bus Riders Union. Um, we are at about 51 passengers per hour today. We used to be at 60 up to 70. 70 was too high. That was an aberration caused by very low fares through one of the early propositions. But 60 passengers per hour, 58 to 62, was a fairly common number for a period of years. They were at 51. With the changes in June, we would be at around 54 passengers per hour, 10% lower than I think was a standard for a long, long time. Now, I have to go. I have to diverge a little bit on schedules 101 because this is this is an, another aspect of the nub of the issue with those who are critical of MTA. Um, there's a thing called the load ratio. Do you know what that is? This takes. So this is not as painful as it sounds. A little bit of transit 101. Each line, five miles <coughs> long, 20 miles long, doesn't matter. Each line has what's called a maximum load point. A max load point. The point on the line where statistically it is the busiest, the loads are the highest. And schedule checkers go out there and they count passengers on and off by stop. So we know what the max load points is uh, for all the lines. The schedule, the frequency, the headway of a line is based on two things. The number of passengers going through the max load point and the load ratio. The load ratio is a policy number. 25 years ago, the number was about 1.45 passengers per seat. 1.45 was probably the floor. It was somewhere between 1.45 and 1.5. What that meant in those days was a bus with, let's say, 43 passengers. Of course, I can't, I'm, my, my brain's a little foggy. With 43 passengers, and a loading ratio of 1.45, you would schedule the bus for 61, about 61 passengers through the max load point. Right, Alan? So, simple math, if you have 610 passengers going past a point in an hour, divide 610 by 61, the product is 10. That means you would have 10 trips in an hour, that means you'd have a six minute headway. Track? So there's passengers past a point, and there's the policy load ratio. And that, from that, you get a headway. <coughs> now, back in those days, by the way, we were 75% on time, very few, if any, trips running ahead of schedule. When I arrived at MTA two years ago, we had 15 or 20% running hot. Wow. Any of you who are transit people know that is a cardinal sin. Mm -hmm. By the way, one of the things that led me to really changing the metro uh, MTA management was, I'd be talking to some guy from New York, and I'd say we have 15, 20% running hot, and he'd go like Alan did, wow, I'm sitting at MTA meetings, and I go, we got 15% running hot, and they go, yeah, yawn, so what? You know, that is an indictment of where we were. So, all right, so 25 years ago, we used a load ratio of 1.45. The rail lines began to be developed. Bus riders union sued based on the principle that we were, that the, the rail lines were principally for, for whites and the bus lines were for minorities, and the load ratios were higher on the bus, and therefore it was inherently a, a discriminatory practice. The net out of that, and it doesn't matter whether you agree, whether you think that was a valid co complaint or not, the, the math is the important thing here. The net out was an agreement, consent decree, to use a load ratio of 1.2 to 1 for a period of years. So, not 1.45 or 1.5, but 1.2. Because of 
differences in bus design, the buses that we have today have the, the standards. I'm not talking about the Artix. I'm not crazy about Artix. I think they're a waste. They're not the best way to study. Um, anyway, so today many of our buses have 40, 40 seats on. So at a 1.2 load ratio, you would have 48 passengers, 8 standees. That was the outcome of the consent decree. In the June schedule change that we're contemplating today, that we're collecting comments on, we are considering a 1.3 load ratio. What does that mean? It means instead of having 48 standees at the max load point, we would have 52. That's what it means. Not 60 or not 70. I should also note, by the way, the average trip length is around four miles on an MTA bus. So the, the, the maximum number of standees would exist for some period of minutes. It's not two hours, it's not three hours, it's not all day. It's 15 minutes or something on that order. So anyway, what we're proposing is to go to a 1.3 load ratio. That governs the, the service reductions <coughs> which are proposed. Uh, and it, that's what accounts for the increase in the Mornings per hour from 51 up to about 53 or 54 following the June change. That's what's being contemplated. Now, the, the draft of change is uh, is out there now for public comment. I would invite you, one of the alliance, I would invite you to make your comments. If you think it's crazy, tell us it's crazy. Uh, whatever you think, you know, there's a process for submitting your information. I have appointed a committee, I meet with them, I think, on Friday of a dozen people who are transit users to come in and meet as a committee and review the changes. And now I have some front page news for you. The schedule makers and the planners who made the proposals are human. They did their best, but they're human. It may be that some smart person or some citizen who rides a given line will come in and say, we think this proposal is a mistake. And it may be that the citizen's right, in which case we'll change it. Some bus lines are proposed to get service increases because riders should decide. I should note, in the face of the service increases which have occurred over the past 20 years, there has not been a commensurate increase in ridership on the bus system. In fact, to the contrary, it's down. So this sounds like sugarcoating bad news. I'm saying we're going to cut service, but it ain't that bad, right? I will also argue that because of what I would regard as inattention in the past to service management, that we can in fact accomplish seeming incompatibles. And that is we can reduce service at the same time as we improve it. Now, how can that be? Tom and I used to go to the Magic Castle, but this is not a magic trick. This is a management practice. This is a matter of focus. Let's go back to our bus that's scheduled with, supposed to have 48 people on it. 1.2 long ratio for second discussion. And let's assume we're running a five minute headway for easy math, five minute frequency. Remember I just said 20% of the buses, 15, 20, were running hot. In transit jargon, the bus in front of me is my leader. If my leader is one minute hot, one minute hot, am I carrying a five minute headway? I'm carrying a six. I'm going to have 20% more passengers. So it won't be 48, will it? What's 20% of 48? No. 10 out of there. It doesn't matter. So it's 10. So I'm not going to have 48, I'm going to have 58. And let's say I fall back one minute. He's only one minute hot, and I'm only one minute late. That's very nearly perfect, right? Very nearly perfect. But I don't have 48 on the bus, I have 68. The guy behind me doesn't have 48, he has 28. Now, on the bus I'm driving, Pardon me, when I broke in 40 years ago, I was informed that MTA operators are bus operators because drivers carry freight, operators carry passengers. 
All right, so the bus I'm operating has 68 passengers on it. There is one fact which is completely evident to everybody on that bus, including the bus operator. And what is that fact? The more passengers you take on, the further behind schedule you'll be. Well, but he doesn't know, he doesn't know the guy in front of him is Ron Hawk. They'll all say, this is a crappy company, there's not enough <laughs> service out here, nobody cares about us, these schedules are terrible, and these people ought to get their heads out of their posterior and have an adequate level of service out here, right? That will be obvious. Everybody on that bus has data to prove that conclusion. So why not just add a trip? The problem with that solution is, well, the good thing about it is it's simple. It's intellectually simple. The problem is it's the most expensive solution because you're wasting resources. A far better solution, which is the one that we focused on, are focused on, is to get our supervisors and our managers and our instructors and our operators to pay attention to what they're doing and to pay attention to a schedule and to run buses and trains on time as scheduled and to view that schedule that says 442 westbound, Wilshire and Western, that is a promise to somebody that bus is going to leave at 442, right? That's a promise. So what's happened in the two-year period Eight, whatever it is, 22 months. That's not very long <coughs> in, the, in the life of a, a big outfit like MTA. On, in the eight years before I arrived, eight years, we had four times in which we had on-time performance of 70% or higher for two months in a row. That occurred four times in eight years. <coughs> We're now at, I don't know, 16 or something months of 70% or higher. In, in, in 22 months, we've gone from a 58, 59% on time to 74, 75% on time. People running hot is down from 15 or 20 down to about five. <coughs> five is terrible. You know, I'm not saying that's good. What I am saying is we're going in the right direction. I don't think we can get to 90% on time on the bus. Yeah, on a train, you can do that. On bus, if you're 75 to 80, you're doing pretty good. But the running hot ought to be very nearly zero. But what that means is we have to get the instructors and the supervisors and the controllers having their head in the game and paying attention. So I believe by improving on-time performance, we <coughs> avoid the hypothetical problem that I just described to you. If we can manage headways and keep the headways balanced, then we do a better job of, balance, of managing the loads and keeping the loads balanced. That improves the experience of all the passengers on the bus. Now the good thing is that the service reductions that we're proposing for June are not being done to, to save money. They're being done to use money more effectively. If I did not think that we could improve the quality of service management, I wouldn't be right to agree to the cuts. But I think we can improve the service quality by doing the things I just outlined for you. Um, so anyway, that's what we're doing. We're going to have our committee of 12 look at it. I invite all of you to make your comments. Um, after the June schedule change, whatever ends up being in that package, we'll go back. I anybody who knows schedules knows that it never ends. It's like everything else, like inventory management in a factory. You always have to manage inventory and schedules because that's where you spend a whole bunch of money. Um, that will be controversial. That will be controversial. There will be some who will claim that we are going back to the dim dark ages of mistreating people. Um, I, will, I will say that what we are not contemplating, period not contemplating, is going to 60 passengers per hour. We are not contemplating going to a 1.45 or 1.5 load ratio uh, at all. It's not under, under contemplation now or next year. In the budget document that we submit, we will have a balanced budget. There, will, there is no financial crisis. We will talk to the board about attacking deferred maintenance. We have deferred maintenance on bus fleets and rail fleets and stations, as I just mentioned. We have made inadequate investment in our freeways. When I was in Orange County, I've had to eat this crow from my Orange County friends any number of times. 
I used to say that Orange County is the place to be because they have theater and restaurants and beaches. You know, it's like a, a, a modern West Coast Manhattan. It's emerging as a West, small West Coast Manhattan, whereas L.A. is emerging as a large West Coast Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> now, does, does anybody like that? <laughs> yeah, the Bronx is nice. <laughs> when you North drive Bronx. along a freeway, and MTA does freeways as well, we must do the freeway program. To get support of the full board for the transit program, we have to show good faith towards a measure our, measure our highway program. And you should not judge the tunnel <coughs> discussion until you have more data. I'll come back to transit now for a minute. Um, <laughs> It used to be that you could drive down the Santa Monica Freeway when I was 30 years old. Some of you are as old. Tom was in Nebraska, so he doesn't remember those happy, happy days. Alan does. The Santa Monica Freeway, the Harbor Freeway, were beautiful. When you drove down those freeways, you knew you were in a world-class city, a wealthy, powerful city. When I say city, I don't mean city of LA. I mean a urban place. Today, when you see interchanges that look like the Bronx, we ought to be concerned. It isn't just aesthetics. It's, it's, we should consider the effect on our children, on tourism, on our ability to attract and retain employers, jobs, uh, and people who want to live here, right? We need to put money into cleaning up the infrastructure specifically the freeway systems. To the board and the budget, I will we'll also talk about training programs for the next generation of uh, managers. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. We have some functions at MTA where 30 to 50 percent of the managers uh, and professionals are 55 or 65 and older. That means they're going to be gone pretty soon. Uh, some functions we can recruit from the outside. Financial, uh, marketing, things like that. But in transit and operations, they don't teach board markup in college. And that's something you have to teach a group of people how to do. So that, I mentioned to you the five-year period. We have a period of time to, to build the next generation. And that means a training program for those, for those functions that we can't draw in from the outside. So that's kind of, kind of kind of what the budget's going to look like, the budget proposal. Now we'll see what the board does with it. There'll be a, a large number of people who'll be very unhappy. Um, you know, what I promise is if somebody asks me a question, I'm going to answer the question. I'll, you know, my, my only other promise is I'll do the best I can. Uh, I understand some may agree, some may disagree, and I'll live with that. Um, and I'd be pleased to take any questions you might have. Or it's worth fighting for. That's a long overdue plan. I really think it has great merit. You know, if, if we go another five years without a general, without retraining a generation of people who understand transit operations, we're going to be. Anybody here seen the Big Lebowski? Sure. We'll yeah. be entering a world of pain. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen the Big Lebowski, you should. Right? <laughs> Art, um, on behalf of the Transit Coalition, I'd like to say thank you for coming back and speaking here. Uh, it's uh, good to have you checking in with us or us checking in with you uh, a year later. And, and certainly a, a lot of uh, focus that you've given to improving the uh, management of operations does show itself. I know as a writer, one of my top frustrations used to be buses running hot and, you know, that most people who aren't familiar with the system interpret that as, oh, my bus is very late, but really your bus was early. And so that, that alone is you know, you the made, nature of your point. Your point is really a good one. When we look at passenger complaint data, you can't take it at face value. Because the, the passenger doesn't know what happened. What they know is there was a disruption. But that doesn't mean that that's where they, they, they may assume the bus is late, but may in fact have been early. And, and I, I, I think one thing that really stands out for me is that right now we're, we're at a crossroads. We are hopefully at a point where sales tax revenues seem to be steadily rising again. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, gasoline prices are also rising quite steadily again. And so that probably uh, implies that there will be increases in ridership. Um, so one of the questions that we have that we pose to Metro is, 
to what extent oh, can we look at uh, having that increase in sales tax revenues uh, potentially offset some of the cuts that you're thinking about in terms of total service? We are very supportive of the idea of reallocating service from where it's inefficiently deployed to where it can be more efficiently deployed. But given the reports that Metro itself has come up with that indicate that choice ridership is down, and a lot of the cuts, the way they're being implemented, not, not the way management is saying, we need to make the system more efficient, but the way it's being implemented on the ground is, rather than taking out duplicative lines, we see non-duplicative lines which may have lower load ratios being taken out or off-peak service being gutted to the point where it's no longer very uh, attractive to choice riders. So the last, you had a question on the state. As regards your statement, the second part of your commentary, if you think we're making a mistake, tell us. If we are eliminating non, or reducing non-duplicative service, tell us. Uh, in this June service cut, I did not mandate a certain number of hours of reduction. Now, if, we, if, if the economy went in the crapper, you know, and we had to cut to balance the budget, I would do that. But that's not what happened here. What I said is, look at the service that's less than efficient and make a, put together a package. That's what they did. If we made a mistake, tell us. As regards your question, uh, what if, in fact, uh, oil prices are climbing and ridership climbs? What we do is, is collect ridership data manually and machine-based, and then the schedulers will look at that by line. That would produce a higher load ratio with the max load point, and then that would produce a recommendation to improve the frequency, incre increase the frequency, make it a better high, high headway. I guess what I'm trying to say is, how can we incorporate the concept of in integrating the frequency level necessary to attract choice riders on lines that have that potential with the load ratio, uh, the load ratio and the uh, passengers past the point? Well, I, I, you know, I, I know that we've done a lot to attract uh, discretionary riders. I'm not persuaded that it's, it's been a, especially money well spent. Um, I think you can offer a very harsh criticism of the way we've integrated or not local bus lines with BRT lines. Um, it looks pretty slick from a non-rider separate service. It doesn't make all the stops. Uh, if you're a passenger at a certain intersection that has a stop for both the local and the BRT, you're trying to figure out whether it be far side or near side, the bus approaches, I'm not sure that's the best thing in the world, are you? So I think what happens is you get the discretionary riders if you're running good service and a clean and reliable vehicle, hopefully with a courteous operator. Um, so going back to basics, I think, is fundamental. A load ratio, policy load ratio of 1.3, would be the, the analytical mechanism by which frequencies would be increased in the event ridership went up. Also, we'd see revenue up as well in that event. Revenue, passenger revenue is down. Some of the things that we've talked about, Mark covered, the Dodger Stadium shuttle. But, you know, I can't say that's life and death, but we're gonna, you know, my requirement on that service was that the Dodgers allow us to co-market the Dodgers with MTA. Uh, so we'll go out and find restaurants and things like that we can take a bus or a train into the station and then take a shuttle bus. That is a process by which we get the discretionary rider to try out the system. There are similar things that are done around the country by systems to introduce non-riders. Frankly, the proposal to offer off-peak trips to schools, I think, is the very same thing. Um, if we package destinations um, Exposition Park, where you can take a class of third graders to see Tyrannosaurus Rex in a month, for example, and you give them fare media and have them pay a fare. Now, we're, we're offering to the school districts, helping them with field trips, but the exchange is 
there has to be a transit ridership component, not just safety, not just don't run in front of the trains, although that's very important, but also to the school kids. Why is it important? Why does it work? When you get old, what should you do? The near a bus stop or a train station? Okay, that will be part of the field trip deal. Uh, you know, we should bring kids down to Union Station and show them all Barra Street and the plaza and maybe the uh, Grand Central Market, things of that nature. By bringing third graders or whatever to use the transit system in that kind of a format, what we're doing is, is teaching the next generation that it's okay. The context in which this is occurring is one in which gasoline prices are going to be climbing. We see urban form changing the last 10 years. Urban form is changing in Southern California. Does anybody here own a house, a single family house in Riverside? If you do, you probably ought to sell it. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Right. So, so we. Riverside's of, better than Moreno Valley. Moreno <laughs> Valley is Riverside. It's, it's oh no, but I mean in the city of Riverside, that might do all right. It's a little closer. No. I just mean, there's Riverside and then so, there's Riverside. So the the con, what's happening here is a cultural shift, a lifestyle shift, which would have been on it to me, no one imagined 20 years ago. I have a son who lives in Highland Park, who's an attorney. Uh, look at all the downtown residential today. When Tom and I were working together, uh, we're walking down Main Street, the lunch was dangerous. <laughs> you know, right? I mean, you, you took your life in your hands almost. I saw people with knives in their stomachs. I saw dead people on the street. Today, 8 o'clock at night, you see couples walking their dog. So what's happening is a whole bunch of changes are occurring, and it is that in that context that we need to offer better service. I will argue that the lousy schedule um, uh, record that we've had, buses running late, buses running hot, uh, is the biggest discouragement to bring in the discretionary rider and the biggest encouragement for the, for the non-discretionary rider to leave the system. And that's what's going to happen. Thank you. We've got to focus on pennies and minutes and details and quality. Um, Alan? Yeah. Art, um, I was just wondering, your, your new ratio, I think, is long overdue. And, you know, the consent decree <coughs> dropped it uh, way below what I think was a, a reasonable ratio and caused to have to buy an awful lot of equipment because of that. Uh, even if you raise it to this new level, it's still below what we had in the 70s, isn't it? Wow. That's what I thought. Well, well right? it used to be 145 now. Yeah. 145 was really the floor, it wasn't the ceiling. To me, I just, I think it's a no-brainer. I don't see how anyone can argue against it. I agree, especially in the context of what we can accomplish with better right. time management. Parts, parts um, uh, Daniel. Um, my main question for you is, is the, we typically spoke about a Back to back your time schedule. Uh, and a lot, a lot of time, a lot of time, the, you know, the initial we, 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 passing the commercials. And, and drivers, drivers, drivers don't tend to, uh, tend to blame on us. Passing a brain then to blame on us because we delayed him. By saying that, what are we, what, what are the plan, mental plan, to not to, uh, to avoid uh, this kind of confrontation between drivers and passengers with people with disability? Well, I, I agree with you. And I think that we have become lax in terms of demanding performance from public operators, um, in terms of on-time performance, in terms of dress, uh, in terms of safety, um, in terms of handling wheelchair passengers, um, in terms of being able to give information to passengers. Um, so in the 22 months since I've been there, we got rid of the sectors. Um, they were all nice people, but they, they weren't coordinated. Two years ago, we had seven schedules departments. Today, we have one. Uh, we are currently reposting the chief instructor job. 
that's the guy that's supposed to establish standards for behavior. We've just agreed to a set of standards on handling wheelchair securement, which is much, much more rigid and appropriate than it has been in the past. So basically, uh, we're increasing the, the undercover rider program. Um, I have said to my coworkers that if there's an employee, an operator, for example, who isn't interested in offering good service, then perhaps they should not be working for us. And we need to have a way of holding people accountable. Um, the, in the last, I don't know, I'll say six months, six months ago we were producing, we have 2,200 buses, a bunch of rail lines. We were producing about 20 rule violation reports a day. Anybody that watches the system knows any one of you can go out and find by yourself 20 problems a day, right? The system was doing 20. Now we're at 200 a day. Now the goal is not to have rule violation reports. The goal is to get the employees to do the work that we need them to do. Uh, on a most simplistic level, we are requiring that division inspectors, for example, do a more thorough fitness for duty inspection before the operator goes out to uh, service. That's basic, but we weren't doing it. We are um, changing the uniform for the supervisor so that it looks appropriate. I'm not just a fascist, but if there's an accident or a detour and the supervisor is there to tell you what to do, how do you know who this person is? if they don't have a uniform on. Mm -hmm. Some guy standing there in a white shirt saying, go this way. Well, why, right? So when I've said that we, that we have a lot of work and just going back to traditional basics, it's that, it's that kind of stuff. I saw a, uh, a, a student, an intern in the building the other day, and the guy had his pants hanging down. <laughs> and I met with the executive staff today. We're not going to permit this system to go into a condition where the employees look like thugs. We're not going to have interns that are permitted to come to work dressing where they look like that. It is a public agency. The public has a right to expect that we break a sweat and focus on details. I think that our management staff got into a brains a mindset. I think the most damaging thing they got into was their whole life's goal was to run more and more service. So we've fallen into a mindset of we want new buses, we want new trains, we want new stations, we want new projects, but we haven't focused on discipline or maintenance. Now that's not that stuff is not so it isn't as glamorous as buying something new, but it's just as important. For the operators focusing on Calling stops, holy smokes. Um, you know, having a standard rule where the bus operator will position the bus needs to be the bus stop. There's a million different things like that, but we have to reinstitute rigor and consistency in our practices. Not just because we want to be inflexible. The service has to be predictable for the passenger. Yeah, yeah. If it isn't predictable, it's not usable. So we have a whole bunch of work to do to reestablish a proper operating culture that, that indicates clearly we're not operating for the convenience of the employees, but rather for the convenience of the passengers. That's a lot of work, and it ain't going to, you know, like, I'll be here next year telling you where we are on it. It's, it's hard to do, it's a lot of work. We have time uh, for wait, one. Wait, 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 no, 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 but let's, okay. I want to try, if I can throw a Hail Mary pass at you, it's, it's either 8, 10 and you've got to go for your train, or we've got an hour's worth of questions, we can keep you busy. It depends on if you need to go. If you want to stay, I can just tell you from the audience that we've got an hour's worth of questions. Well, when it, I'll, I'll come back on the time, like next month or two months. We could do that. Um, just okay. I, mean, I'm, I don't mind coming over here and talking with you about this stuff. Um, I we have a, a Senate and the House hearing tomorrow morning. I got to get to. And no, if you've got to do that, and we we're actually going to be there too. So uh, a lot of us. So stronger than I am. <laughs> I wish, but uh, maybe we got time for a one final question then. And not, not Ruben. Anybody? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm just kidding. Which Ruben? <laughs>
That's not funny. Um, <laughs> Eric. Uh, you mentioned that, that uh, you plan to be instrumental in training the new generation of managers. Um, perhaps uh, in military, military tradition, training their relief. Uh, but uh, put into context, the, the board of directors, the MTA board, has adopted a long-range plan uh, to, 20, to, by 2040, spend $300 billion uh, on roughly a third on uh, bus-related matters, uh, roughly a third on highway and street uh, capital and uh, maintenance, uh, and, and then you've got the rail component, which is capital, rolling stock, and so on. Um, and it, it, it seems that these managers need to be able to implement that plan, this $300 billion plan. But you're talking about oil problems, the, the economy, and government money, and the sources of this $300 billion being virtually all tax, tax revenues. Um, this thing could go haywire uh, 5, 10, 20 years. Um, I just wonder if, if you're, if you think you should be prepared, uh, or you should be preparing your new manager to manage that 30-year plan uh, to keep it from absolutely uh, just dissembling. I, I, I've told the board that my goal is to have a half a dozen people employed the MTA in the classroom. Now, I want competition at all levels for all positions amongst the smart people. Um, I think you're right, we, the undertaking is immense. It may be the biggest, biggest public works program, locally funded public works program in the history of the Republic. Um, and, you know, I intend to do it properly during the time period that I'm, I'm at the end. Um, you know, Bart, when I come back, if you want, I'll just talk for like five minutes, then we can just open it right up for questions. But I agree, um, we, have, we have a significant management undertaking, and that's going to be, that's really hard. That's really one of the reasons I came to NTA. And, um, but the good side is we're, we're shaping the future of the city. Uh, it's already I really came here time, for a drink. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, just, I made a joke about don't let Tom ask a question. I, I want to say I meant that as a joke. Tom and I have spent... Who knows how many hours? I could probably predict what he would say, and he could predict what I would say. We could make each other's arguments. Do you think that's true? To a large extent. Anyway, when I, I'll come. You know, let me know. When I'll come back again next month, the month after. Well, you know what? It'd be interesting because theoretically, our guest next month is Matt Raymond. But Matt is the only guest I've ever had who just managed to tell me three days before that he couldn't make it. So maybe. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'd like to have Matt in the TAP system, but uh, I wouldn't mind having you back in the uh, next couple months. That's up to you. Um, <coughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure Matt comes next month, and if he doesn't, we'll... Well, we, I can do the month after. I, and I, might, I want to just say one more thing on this. I don't, I don't have any stock in the MPA. The dividend program is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I get paid a salary. The board represents the stakeholders. That's you guys, and a couple other million people, several other million people. So what I will do, I tell my coworkers, there's a, a happy fiction. They allow us to tell them the truth, and we do. Sometimes it's not easy, but we do. Um, and then I have to respect that they get to make the decision come and talk to you or any other group, I will tell you the truth. I don't try to customize answers because I can't remember all the things I said. So therefore, I try to tell the, tr the truth as best I can, as best as I understand it. And so I'll be, ha Bar, I'll be happy to come back. We'll make a deal. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and close the fight on. Yeah. <laughs>